my the the way I trade is I talk about the meat the meat counter. Uh, so the the meat counter idea is now we're talking. <laughs> so let's say that you're at the grocery store and there's a few meat counters. Um, one has like terrific meat. It's really really good. It's been good for a while. There's a massive lineup there. Um, there's buyers there, and let's just say that they also will buy some of your meat. So there's some sellers in there too. Um, and so uh, the one meat counter will be popular for a while, but then the lineup becomes so long and so large that people start thinking, hey, maybe this next guy here or, um, or lady um, that's selling meat is equally as good. And maybe I should get over there and try some of that meat. And one person goes and another person goes. And then there's a point where the entire crowd will turn their heads and they'll go, you know what? Let's rush there before that line gets too long. Sounds like every day in Penny Cats. <laughs> All right. Welcome back to the Steady Trade Podcast. As I mentioned, we're continuing our inter interview series, I guess I would say. You know, we, we always like to, you know, bring as much as possible to the podcast. I mean, there's, there's so many things in trading and finance and styles. I mean, there's high price, there's low price, there's day swing investing, Forex, cryptos, you know, there's a million different things to trade, a million different styles. And Something Steve and I have talked about since the beginning is spend that time to find your style. Because again, just because you want to buy stocks, maybe that's not for you. Maybe you want to short stocks. Maybe you find out it doesn't necessarily fit your style. Maybe you, you know, some an interesting podcast from a little while ago with like Tom Canfield. You know, he was a long time swing trader for like 20 years. 20 years later, as a full time day trader, just started getting, or, or as a full-time swing trader, just started getting into day trading. So that's why we want to bring as much as possible to every, all of you, just so you can get every perspective. And today we've got Dell, the trader. Um, you know, I'm kind of getting meet, to meet Dell myself. Um, and, uh, you know, he's got a little bit of a history. He's, you know, he's got a, 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 a bunch of stuff on his YouTube channel, which a lot of his guests that he had, I would like to, you know, to, to, to kind of weasel my way in and maybe get some of them on this podcast. So, well, actually, let me mention, if you're on YouTube, or I'm sorry, if you're on iTunes, we got the whole crew here. We got Kim, we got Steven, and we got Dell. So, welcome, Dell. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, really excited to be here. And yeah, I'm a fan of your podcast as well. Uh, like I was telling Tim, like, there's so many episodes and so much content to go through. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to share and just talk and um, always trying to help new traders is a bit of a passion of mine. Um, so connecting to a new group and new set of listeners is, is amazing. So also yeah, commend you guys for putting this together. I know it's a lot of work. I don't know how you do it. You yeah. must all four get together to kind of put your skills together to get this, that amount of content out. So it's a big value to the community. And honestly saving a lot of people um, from some really, really rough seas out there, um, gaining this information and, and just helping the community. So thanks you guys. So if you don't yeah. mind, just, you know, kind of, and thank you, thank you. Um, we, we, we love it. You know, it's kind of like, it's one of those things like, you know, we record almost every week and, you know, I actually had to, I canceled last week, um, last minute. And it, I mean, it kind of bummed me out. It's just, but I think, Kim, Steven, and I, we all love doing it. So I, th I think that hopefully that shows through, but uh, yeah, if you don't mind, give a little bit of, you know, you give a little background, um, sure. share as much as you want, but you know, I, th I think, you know, our podcast is mainly geared towards newer, uh, you know, newer traders. So I think a lot of people are always like these episodes because they're like, whether they're one week or one month or one year in, they kind of like, Hey, okay, am I headed the right way or, or what pitfalls can I maybe avoid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bet. Um, well, a bit about me, I guess. Um, so I am a, I don't know if I can call myself a full-time trader anymore. 
Um, I've gone from the day trading scene where I was a full-time trader trading nine to five and, um, you know, in there as much as possible. But now in my current style of trading, I've got much more time on my hands and I, and I focus on a lot of different things, a lot of different projects, but trading is an enormous passion of mine and will continue to be so for a long time. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a lot of people know me from the bear versus pig podcast. Um, I didn't make too many of them. Um, honestly, it was, um, it was just a, a bit of a, a selfish sort of, uh, objective of trying to get my trading strategy in front of some traders that I admired and that I wanted to learn from. Um, and, uh, I, I used my sort of YouTube personality to do that. Um, and, um, you know, on Twitter, I go by the handle Della Trader. Uh, I, started with you know forex trading about six seven years ago maybe eight years ago kind of hard to know because back then it was all a bit of a, of a blur losing money left now right. now why why forex did you make the, <laughs> did you make the standard I, i'm gonna guess i'm gonna guess you saw 100 bucks to start an account and you saw 100x leverage and 24 yeah. hour trading and you're like i'm in baby yeah well i mean <laughs> nine to five job i was looking at what you know what which is nothing wrong with that either. but i was just curious if that's exactly. what you saw no it. you're you're totally right um <laughs> it was it was the advertising got me you know and i wanted to make some money fast and it's the story for everybody um but uh you know i quickly learned that a from losing money either i was gonna fight or flight and i decided to fight and um i didn't last that long maybe about six months of of losing money and when i say losing money maybe a hundred bucks a week at a time which in the world of you know trading a few you know a dollar fifty per trade on, on in forex that was quite a, a few losing trades <laughs> um after i got through that hump i realized you know there, there must be something out there and that's when i went out and started the down the path that everyone goes down which is you know find a, a guru, learn, try to learn from them. You know, uh, you know, Tim Sykes, obviously, you know, <laughs> you guys are, are, um, fully, uh, uh, uh I guess, uh, students of that, of, yep. of Tim's. Uh, I learned a lot from, from Tim and just his free content online. Um, so I spent, after spending money left and right, I, um, I, uh, realized that I had more of an investment outlook when it came to trading. I didn't, enjoy having to sit down and stare at a screen um it became a passion when i turned it into a puzzle that i had to try and solve um, but still i would rather not be spending so much time in front of the screen um, so i went from trading forex to trading futures and that's really when where i learned my craft and i took a lot from futures traders um, who for some reason are so invested in the technical, deep technical analysis, order flow analysis, understanding, um, you know, uh, using, uh, you know, auction market theory, uh, that all of that type of stuff, it really helped me understand what was going on behind the candlesticks. Um, and then that sort of opened the, opened the world to me of exploring um, different areas to innovate inside of that space. Uh, and then taking that, learning and, and bring it in, into the world of stocks where there was more volatility and um, more excitement. And so I did that for a number of years, made some YouTube channels to help people kind of cut down the amount of time they need to spend in learning, um, telling them what not to do and just giving them some focus um, without saying that I know everything about it, give me a bunch of money. Um, I was making sure that anybody that, you know, I helped, uh, and I still mentor to this day, they don't pay me a penny. And that's, um, that's the only like mentorship men mentee relationship that I'd, that I'd want to keep. So uh, I'm, I'm paying it forward. And at the same time, I'm learning from a lot of different people and the podcast on bear versus pig on my YouTube channel is all, and, and it's on iTunes and all that as well is all about me continuing those conversations with people as a trader talking to other traders. So kind of similar to what you guys do as well. So uh, I think that sums it up. Uh, and right now I'm, um, I'm trading uh, large caps uh, using options, um, but I'm using a, a future slash small cap strategy that I used in the past to get all of that done, uh, which I think is a little innovative, quote unquote, and unique. Uh, 
So yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll just jump in because I, I, we've all we've all dived into the the kind of the higher cap stocks like the, I I saw a couple of big tickers like Netflix, AMD, probably been trading Tesla. I'd imagine after it went from that six hundred to one thousand runner, you left it alone. But um, a lot of people I speak to the the strategy boils down to. Um, I don't want to make it sound too simple, but obviously you say kiss, keep it simple, stupid. A lot of people I know who are trading these profitably are just basic support and resistance, shorting the double tops, buying the double bottoms, um, taking the higher low off the WAP. Obviously the stock has to be overextended or undervalued, but there's still it's overextended stocks, short the double top. Watch obviously correlated to the spy and look at what the overall market's doing. Is your strategy like that or do you, are you playing something totally different? It is uh, like that. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm doing something completely different. Oh, wow. So Can you the, elaborate? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you bet. <laughs> uh, so one of the things I love doing is, um, and you know, the reason why I jumped into trading stocks, small cap stocks, the pigs, is because it gave me a chance to try to study um, the battle between buyers and sellers. Uh, using volume analysis and market profile. And um, so it was kind of hard to do that. There weren't many, many tools. I used Bookmap for quite some time as well to take a look at the order flow the, that where I could see the orders that were being placed, the orders that were being filled, um, and then try to extrapolate areas of conflict between buyers and sellers from a technical analysis perspective. And then I built strategies and I meticulously using various uh, spreadsheets um, was able to run um, regressions based off of some battles that I saw between buyers and sellers that uh, when they came to fruition, meaning when there was um, a, um, let's say the buyers won, there was sort of a footprint left behind on the chart. And, and, and this footprint. um, So in, in the world of, in the world of um, small caps or micro cap stocks, I should say, um, it's really easy to see this because it's usually the institutional buyers or the company trying to sell shares because of some release uh, or because of some raise they had or, or something's going on. And so they sell, for example, you know, maybe 10,000 shares at a time in blocks. And you can see that when you're trading these micro cap stocks, you can see them coming in and pushing the bids down. Or, or just pushing buyers and sellers around. And when that happens, if you had done the proper research and you know what the stock is attempting to do when it comes to dilution and all that type of stuff, you're able to make um, a good guess that they need the price to be lower in order to continue their game. And so that, that sort of analysis um, doesn't work in large caps because the volume is so great. It's so difficult to dis- uh, distinguish one buyer from another buyer. And so one thing that does kind of um, uh, translate is the, um, the patterns and every single market is different for this, right? Every single instrument is different. I should say the pattern of how buyers and sellers will react and how that shows up on the chart. And so this is where I use um, market profile and volume analysis to identify little fingerprints left behind in, that, in the resolution of that battle between buyers and sellers. And I mark them up on my chart. And it's kind of difficult to explain without showing you, um, but um, I'm able to kind of collect these across through time and then run regressions on them to give me an idea of when this is likely to happen again, given the proper uh, circumstances. Now, it doesn't work all the time, and it's sometimes it's really hard to spot, um, but I've managed to catch some very, very, very large swings. And if you take a look at my my Twitter, you'll see that I caught the drop in 2008, and I just, uh, sorry, 2008, uh, the drop in 2018 in December, um, and I also caught this last drop last week. Um, you, you don't think that's nothing to do with coronavirus, uh, but the, the, the technical elements 
mm. all fall in line based on the news anyway. Yeah. Well, the funny thing about the news is that, and anything that affects a stock in a large or an instrument in a large way, um, it just makes the technical patterns play out faster. Yeah, yeah. I thought, in, yeah, in I thought. Opinion, right. And but, so, like, the technical pattern needs to be there for me to trade it. If not, yeah. I'm not trading it. I don't care what happens in the news. Yeah, no, I just, I mean, you, you, you seem, I mean, where you, we've come from penny stock land and <laughs> penny stock land is pretty simple. When it's up yeah. too much and it hits resistance, you go short. If it goes above the resistance, you cover. Right. The, uh, penny stocks have so, so little fundamentals that it's quite basic. But you seem like you, you're taking on uh, more complex uh, patterns with a more complex system, which, which makes me have to ask, <laughs> a good penny stock trader will win 70% of the time. 70 to 75 what percent of the time are you winning based on the fact that you've got all of this extra analysis uh yeah well i mean for large caps my win rate is much higher than it was for small caps because small caps i was trading a lot more and i had more setups whereas in large caps i i can basically afford to just wait for the right setup and yeah, just go big on this yeah so I, I, w- yeah. I was going from you know the low like late 30s to low 40s um, in terms of win rates across, yeah. uh, I had three patterns, um, yeah. and now short, short or long, <laughs> uh, short. <laughs> 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 and uh, now um, with trading large caps, um, it's hard to say because I've been doing it for I guess just about a year. Um, but really, the last six months, I guess, can can be up- applicable. Um, I, it, it looks to be up in the higher sixties to seventies, but I, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet the, the farm on that. Even Johnson from steady trade. I was just wondering, do you ever look at the market each morning and think, I don't know what stocks they're out to trade. I don't know what's hot. I don't know what's what, I don't know where to get in, why and how. If so, I just wanted to talk to you quickly about Oracle daily direction alert. It's actually an email every morning telling you the hottest stocks of the day. And based on AI information and algorithmic technology, big words, it basically tells you where you should be in and where you should be out of the stock that day uh, to give you a basis to hopefully profit, but to develop knowledge and understanding um, through getting active screen time and recommendations. So, so you, you were mentioning you, you know, you were using this strategy in small caps and, and, and you were able to kind of see these things happening because the volume wasn't as high. So like for me and, and well, me and Steven, maybe me even more. I mean, the, what I focus on is only, you know, the nut job stock of the day, you know, I N O yesterday. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's traded 125 million shares. Okay. So were, were you doing this in more illiquid stocks or, or, or kind of explain that mm-hmm. because, because to me, like, like when I'm trading I and O, I don't even, I mean, you know, level two is a disaster. You know, it's like, I'm just looking at, you know, at key levels, you know, high, I mean, that yesterday, that, that high volume, high a day break on I and O was beautiful. It spiked four bucks a share from five to nine. And I know everyone's bag short because it tracks sideways all day. But did you, were you, were you able to see that with the really liquid penny stocks or not? Uh, well, yeah, you're actually, it's much easier to see that in okay. the liquid penny stocks. So when the, so I had a number of parameters when I was trading these small caps, micro cap stocks, um, you know, and you kind of wait for the volume to come into the, to the ticker before you even, it, it even hits your radar. Right. Um, everyone does that. And you guys do that too. And uh, that, that amount of volume is also um, uh, in line with the amount of volume that it's traded with in the, in the past. And so, a relative volume is super important to me um, and it continues to be in large caps, although it's uh, volume is much more consistent in large caps. Um, but um, if there is volume that is, let's say two, three, four times the normal relative volume of a previous spike, then there needs something's going on there. There's extra market participants. Some, somebody is pulling the trigger uh, when they have it in the past. And so th- I would use Bookmap, which is basically, if you guys aren't familiar with it, it's an, uh, a way for you, uh, an order flow tool that allows you to see um, the bid and the ask. 
and uh, on a timeline. And then it sort of also shows you the orders that have been placed but not filled, which is something that a chart won't show you. Uh, you can do this with the level two as well. Um, and a lot of people for many years will stare at these like flashing numbers in the level two and they'll be able to understand it. This sort of gives you a shortcut. So if I was still trading um, uh, these microcap stocks, I'd still be using that right now. Um, but the, I, it's, although it sounds complicated what I'm, what I'm doing, it's actually very, very simple because it's a methodology. It's not an indicator that you throw on the chart. It's not, um, it's not a pattern that you look for. It's a methodology of understanding um, the battle between buyers and sellers. And I mean, I don't know how deep you guys want me to go on this stuff, but um, whenever I explain my, the, the way I trade is I talk about the meat, the meat counter. Uh, so the, the meat counter idea is... Now we're talking. <laughs> so let's say that you're at the grocery store and there's a few meat counters. Um, one has like terrific meat. It's really, really good. It's been good for a while. There's a massive line up there. Um, there's buyers there and let's just say that they also will buy some of your meat. So there's some sellers in there too. Um, and so, uh, the one meat counter will be popular for a while, but then the lineup becomes so long and so large that people start thinking, Hey, maybe this next guy here or, um, or lady, um, that's selling meat is equally as good. And maybe I should get over there and try some of that meat. And one person goes and another person goes. And then there's a point where the entire crowd will turn their heads and they'll go, you know what? Let's rush there before that line gets too long. Sounds like every day in penny class. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, but identifying that point in the market where everyone turns their head, that's the key in my mind. And by doing that, and, and I often say that, you know, the, the objective of, of technical analysis isn't to tell you where the price is going to go. It's just to identify areas of conflict. And when there's been conflict in the past, there is likely to be conflict again. So what do you need to watch in terms of the bit and the ask in order to identify that, yes, this is irregular and it's most likely that there's going to be a continued influx of volume inside of this next region. Therefore, this, um, this uh, area, a previous area of conflict becomes like a magnet zone. And there's uh, different ways to, to look at this, but yeah, using you know, volume profile on a chart is the simplest way um, to, to kind of visualize this type of... Uh, Del, I have a question for you. Yeah. How long did it take you to come up with this particular style? Uh, I've learned from others, you know, and you know, not, nothing is, um, is original really. Um, I learned from James Dalton quite a bit on his, uh, his studies in, in auction market theory. Uh, I took a lot from that. Um, there's a lot of other futures traders like futures trader 71. He's really good as well. Um, but the, uh, and then I also took from, you know, people that trade stocks and the way that they look at level two and how they read level two. And there's a lot of similarities in, in the techniques that people use to tape read, to do level two analysis, to do um, this um, uh, auction market theory. And then also other people that I've learned from that will do um, order flow analysis, which is a uh, a deeper level of level two analysis. And I kind of just took all of that and put it together into the, what I found to be the most valuable pieces. I like to call it market auction theory. It's different than auction market theory and it kind of, people will understand it. Um, but um, end of the day, it's just a way to say, hey, this part on the chart is more interesting than the next part on the chart. And that just by identifying that and watching those, those levels, and then seeing how buyers and sellers enter this zone. And then what happens in terms of volume, in terms of like, if there was a war there, how many bodies are left? Um, that's usually the, the volume at, at 
time, which is the volume at the bottom of the page that you see, and you see the, the repercussions of that. And then, and then, um, and then I, I use, I can use other tools to kind of, um, um, identify whether this is an area that's likely, um, to, um, have buyers and sellers explode out of and run away from, or whether they're, they're really trying to kind of gather themselves there and create a balance point. So you so. had these mentors and these learnings that you got exposed to. So just take us like to the timeline of when you started, when this became the place you wanted to focus, and then you found yourself consistent and profitable, just so we have a sense of your timeline. Yeah, sure. Um, it, it, it took me quite a, a bit of time to become profitable. Um, so I was completely not profitable on Forex, like we, like we talked about. Um, in then uh, trading futures, I began to use, you know, the, I, I, I took the world of Fibonacci and advanced patterns from Forex and I tried to apply it in the world of futures. It didn't really work out that well. And then I learned about order flow there. I learned about uh, Jim Dalton and those teachings. Um, and then I started to look at order flow analysis uh, through a variety of sources, some in just in the middle of some forum somewhere with some guy that had been trading for 50 years and you know doesn't want to give out his real name, but you can tell by the way that he talks about the markets that he's, it's true. Uh, that type of stuff. And uh, I traded in futures, I traded uh, gold and crude oil um, very often. And then I managed to um, become profitable uh, sometime around 2014, 2015. Um, and, and how far in were you at that point? Uh, I was a few years in at that point. Um, so four, it was, it was, four years. Yeah, a few, okay. a few years in. I don't, I don't know exactly like when yeah, well, um, but it, that it's profitability didn't last and I ended up blowing up an account and then, you know, I went back to the drawing board and then tried to learn again. And then I, I kind of buckled down on a particular strategy and I found that by trading one strategy really well, I did much better than spreading my mind across multiple instruments and multiple strategies. Uh, even something as just focusing on a head and shoulders pattern. That's it. Yeah. And then up, trying to apply that methodology to touch points inside of the head and shoulders pattern. And that right now for me is like a core, a really core pattern. Um, yeah, just, just to jump in as well and just stress the importance of that. Like to try and be the master of all patterns and the, the jack of none or whatever. Like to try and be, like to try and let your ego take over and be like, I will master the market. I will master everything. And I'll take a couple of trades a day and I'll nail every set up. Because it's good for the ego. It is good for the ego, but it, it never ends up good for the bank account. Um, and if someone can just sit, I mean, it's, not, it's hypothetical. If you can sit with $100,000 in a bank account and say, my pattern will come twice a month. But when it comes, I'm, 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 I know it so well. I'm going to trade it with the best risk reward. I'm going to read it brilliantly. And the risk reward might be 4 to 1, 5 to 1, 6 to 1, because I've got it down. Um, and, you, and you go, not, I don't want to say full size, but you take a good position. You're making you five to ten thousand dollars every month with none of the work, with no work. It's much easier, but um, but no one can do this because as humans, we want to prove a point to ourselves every day. I, do you want to elaborate well on that? Well said. Do you agree? Do you know what I mean? I don't know that I could say it any better than that, but. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, but do you agree though? It's so true. I agree. I agree. It's totally true. And you can tell people, you can tell them over and over and over again, and it will not sink in until they blow up an account. It just won't. Or, or 50 accounts. <laughs> or 50 accounts, right? Which at that point, call it like a hotline or something, you know? It's so, so Del, what <laughs> you have the discipline to not keep jumping in, to be loyal to your pattern, to this that you saw what, what helps you stay to it to this day? Uh, yeah, honestly, just uh, complete, um, complete cockiness that my pattern is the best it's like, it's like inverse cockiness, though. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of like what Steven talked about, the cockiness that, oh, I can trade anything any day. Yeah. But I like the way you put that. But I'm, I think it's like inverse cockiness, that it's, <laughs> it's just my setup. Yeah. There's nothing else worth trading because... It's, it's not, it's just not going to do it for me. 
And I know at the end of the day that even though there may be better strategies out there, I'm going to stop looking now. And that's something that people have to do because we'll jump from strategy to strategy to strategy. And, you know, I jump from market to market and trading different markets, but I'm still using the same core strategy. Mm. And so I'm, I'm just trying to see which one, like what, what market am, am I able to be the most successful in? And I think people have a hard time with just stopping the learning, you know, at some point, which is kind of counterintuitive, but you sort of need to buckle down and become a master of your craft and and so you're still learning you're still you're, you're still exposing yourself to new information to see if your pattern could be improved upon strong opinions held lightly i think that's the the most important like that. i'm piece. stealing that a good yeah, good yeah. and so when i when i created bear versus pig i was all i was you know to answer your, your question kim i became consistently profitable um probably uh, in the last three years of trading uh, micro cap stocks. And that was, that was by going so deep into the patterns that I was trading into my trade setups, I should say that I was looking for uh, exact ratios between buyers and sellers in the, in the order flow when it came to entering a market. And I had done regressions and I had done Excel sort of, <laughs> Uh, analysis to tell me that I can have this level of confidence and it, it became from like whether I should enter the trade or not to you know how how does this line up with how well I've done in the past and if it's a green light I'm taking it I don't care what the I don't care if there's in the middle of a 2008 crash I'm gonna take it and so um, you know also something that's really, really important. And I think I'm, I'm about to go off topic. What was the previous question you asked me? I was just Only curious how you stayed disciplined. Your first answer was kind of cockiness, you know, staying. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So staying, staying disciplined was about, um, yeah, un understanding that there's, there's one way to be successful and it's through putting your mental energy on into one, one area of work, you know, and that's in anything in life, like you have to specialize before you move on to something else. Right. Yeah. Do you feel that just as a baby trader and you know, I'm not even a baby trader. I'm just a baby who's looking at trading, right. Cause I'm not even trading yet, but do you see that this technique you're using could ever run its course? Could could would you ever have to potentially change? Is that? Uh, no, no, actually, and and this is part of like the confidence and the slash cockiness factor, which is beyond confidence. This is um, like I I, I believe, uh, and not to say maybe I'm right, I don't know. But I, I believe that this way of of digesting markets and this methodology can be applied to every single market where you have access to proper volume information. And, and order flow information and so like I'm, I'm sort of just applying this to as many I'm testing it as much as possible and so my podcast Bear Bruce Big is um, these are this is where these are the people that I'm uh, that I've kind of gone to and said can you break this strategy I have is there anything here that you would change is there anything I'm doing wrong you know and with that whole strong um, strong ideas or um, um, holding holding those ideas lightly is yeah I'm passionate about it I'll defend it but if you if you can logically tell me why this is incorrect I'll give it up in a split second. Is your pattern threatened by people knowing about it? Oh no, absolutely not. No, no, absolutely not. No, it's a it's it's just a, a, a my my theories about the market and, and between buyers and sellers, it's something that will play out in the heightened emotional states of people. And, you know, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, Kim, what basically what he's doing is, is his system is his way of reading the emotion of the markets. And, and, and in my opinion, I don't want to speak for Dell, but that's yeah. how I interpret it. And right. remember, that's the beauty of humans, you know, yeah. whether it be, you know, the East T India company, or the tulip mania, or today's penny stock, or yeah. today large cap stock. The reason you know that, that that's what he's doing is he's just yeah. trying to read the emotions of the market, and that that this system I mean, has, has enabled him to do that. But I mean, but isn't that what every trader does? They use data to analyze human emotion to then predict the next occurrence of human emotion. We're all doing the same. 
And what, what I like about what Dal's doing is he's got his own kind of unique, it's a bit more unorthodox compared to what most traders do. But ultimately what he's doing is he's found as many possible variables as he can analyze. He's analyzed them all. He's created a methodology based on the analysis. And then he's tried to add more variables to make it as more precise, more precise, more precise um, to, 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 to get a slim amount of trades that are very high risk reward ratio, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll what, maybe it, 10 trades every couple months, you know? Yeah, but I mean, it's what every trader should do, to be honest. I mean, unless you're like a Stephen Ducks genius and you've got like a billion strategies for every single market situation. The, for me, the ultimate way is find the high risk reward strategies, look for them every morning and take them. It's a lot of work to get to where you are though. That's the only yeah. problem. And, yeah, and that, that actually, that's my, one, of, one of my questions. You, and, and this is a compliment, okay? okay? You seem extremely level-headed and extremely analytical. So, and, and share whatever you want, but like, like what's your background? I mean, are you, I, I get a feeling like maybe some engineering in here somewhere or, or what, what, what's your background? So I've worked with engineers my entire life. Fair um, enough. Hey. My, <laughs> my dad is a, my dad was a computer engineer. Okay. And, ah, I got it. Oh, so I, you know, I grew up, <laughs> I grew up building computers with him, soldering, understanding how circuitry worked. Um, but I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm analytical in the sense that um, if there's, if I can see value, I will dive down deep into it until to the point where people say, I can't believe you do this much research in something. So it's a bit of like an obsessive nature turned the right way uh, or in the right direction, I should say. Um, but, um, you know, if you ask me to, you know, read a math book or do something related to, to university or college in the U.S., um, I would probably just, you know, fall on my ass. So it's, it's, it's different, you know, it's, it's just about, about that. Um, Everyone has different skills. Well, I think yeah. you want to be curious. Uh, you're, you're deeply curious about things you're curious about, and you don't yeah. want somebody else telling you what to be curious about. Yeah, my wife has to give me a, uh, you know, time and place to not think about this stuff. <laughs> and so it's it's a line in the sand you know um and i also played quite support? a bit of- do you have support from her and from oh. the people around you for what you do oh absolutely yeah yeah she is she is the reason why i'm successful and, and why i can continue to achieve my passions and how important do you think that is to traders to have support either with their partner or their people around them i mean you're going to go through a period of time where everyone tells you you're wrong for doing this that you're going to lose uh, there's there's enough negativity out there um when you yeah. choose a partner whether even if it's a roommate somebody that can give you just you know the right energy that's or or even just give you the space to, to do what you want to do um and not not bring you down that's super important with anything i mean even in a workplace it's just you, you surround yourself with people that enable you right yeah but i, but I think also you have to have some sort of burning desire and passion which is ignited underneath you to just think i am going to do this no matter what like no one can tell me otherwise i am dead certain that i'm going to do this you need to have that because there's so much failure or negativity around you yeah yeah and i come from a strong product background like i um, in terms of developing and launching products for the masses um, i've worked with some of the biggest companies in the world and i help them launch their products and so, you know, behavioral analysis, understanding the, the user and what people want, what people are going to do has really, and also managing production teams has really helped me um, understand that the, the wants and needs of buyers and sellers. And then I kind of leverage those skills to develop you know, my podcasts or my YouTube videos or whatever it may be, kind of turn myself into a product a bit selfishly so that I can get access to the people that I want to learn from. Dell, are you comfortable telling us how old you are? Sure. I'm uh, 34. So you got started about eight years ago. Yeah, seven, eight years ago, something yeah. like that. So what do you attribute to, I, I, it seems, yes, analytical, but also just like an emotional maturity. It sounds like you've had that for a while. What do you attribute that to? 
uh, definitely my wife, the emotional part. <laughs> she, but uh, um, no, I, I think it's just, I think it's just, uh, you know, I don't know. Am I allowed to swear on here? Just, yep. It's, yep. it's <laughs> cutting, it's cutting the shit. You know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a point in time when every trader kind of, they want to trade because it's cool because, you know, they, they see Tim, Tim Sykes, you know, on a yacht or something like that. And it's, you kind of want the lifestyle. You, you want that type of thing. And that is a direct road to ruin. Um, and so like being fully aware of what your limits are and then being humble when it comes to the market, when it comes to the amount of time that you put towards something, um, you know, even your own personal health and mental well-being, all that type of stuff is super important to being able to learn the most, right? We are a cup that's constantly trying to be filled. And if we overflow, it, it doesn't mean we're, we're stopping. Um, we're stopping. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're learning a lot. It means that we're losing a lot in terms of things that we could be learning. And so I think having that balance is, um, will reflect in all parts of life as well as your trading if you just you know turn the dreams into um edible pieces of work and 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 sort of schedule something for yourself in terms of what your week to week goals are as opposed to i want to be on a yacht someday yeah i tell you i love your love your approach and it's something that we talk about every day on the podcast is you know and, and it sounds like you you went down that journey we all do you know, and, and what I love now is you've got this system, but you're, you know, you're in essence, you're a part-time trader. You said you're making like 10 trades every couple months, but because of that fact that you've developed this system. And I mean, it, it, one of the biggest things that, that annoys me is, and you know, you see so many people flame out is because everyone tries to do it full time. And it's like, this is all I'm going to do. And there's, there's no better way I think than to blow up your account is mm -hmm. when you're sitting there, you got nothing else to do. Your setup's not there. So now you start trying all this different yeah. stuff. And I think, I mean, I mean, listen, somebody, there's going to be a lot of people, Paul Tudor Jones, you know, whoever it is that is that full-time trader. But I just beg people. I'm like, just do this on the side, especially for the first two, three, four, five years, man. And then sure. that, I think, listen, there, there's still, you know, they talk about the 90% failure rate, but I think if you do it on the side with less pressure, you got a job, you got, I always say this, I mean, health insurance, you know, it's like, you know, it's like the market don't give you no health insurance, you know, and, and if you've got this job mm -hmm. that lessens the pressure and I think it magnifies your odds of success over time. Yeah. And, and you know, I got a, um, I mean, I think you're spot on and, and it's, again, it's that type of thing where people can hear it. They can hear it on a podcast. They can read about it. You know, their mentors can tell them about it, but it will not sink in until they lose some money. And so, um, I put out a tweet a couple of weeks ago where, you know, like I had a, I had a chat room for a while and I was trying to, my objective was trying to cre uh, pick out the traders that um, I felt had a lot of potential and sort of create like a special forces team that kind of clone myself and see how many of myself I can create so that I can improve my, my own trading. Everything is, is and I'm, honestly, it is a selfish sort of endeavor. Um, no, the problem I, just, I want to stop you there because you, you mentioned well-being a few times. But then you've mentioned selfish, the word selfish quite a lot of times in this podcast. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of the times in the context that you've said selfish, you've actually been selfish, which <laughs> I just want to pick up on it because for me, I think you're creating opportunity and you're being smart, but you're not being selfish in any way. So I'm just curious as to why you're, you're using that word because it's got negative connotations. I guess so. I guess so. Um, in the sense that I'm thinking about myself before I'm thinking other people. So but, but you should think of yourself before you think, I mean, if I, you think of yourself before your wife every day, I'm like, oh, he's a bit selfish. <laughs> but if you think of yourself before strangers, that's not selfish, bro. Okay. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, but I, you know, I see it as there's a better way of doing things than what the community is doing right now. Um, there's a lot of garbage out there and there's a lot of people that are looking to take advantage. And 
there's, there's being selfish and then there's taking advantage. I don't take advantage of people. I can say that, but I can be a little bit selfish in the sense that my goals are coming before yours because, Hey, it, but you, but you also trading. teach people for free. <laughs> I teach people for free. And this oh. is the thing. So this is the thing. Um, for me, the, the best way to learn has always been to teach. I, I find like there's gaps in what, if I can't explain something clearly and thoroughly to somebody, I don't know it well enough. And so I'm, and it's sort of, I kind of like teaching, teaching because of that. It's a, a bit of an incentive to continue going, creating a new YouTube video or that I haven't done in a while, or, um, you know, having, having focus in something that is learning. It's more exciting for me to do that and then dive into sections of a book, then go from front to back in a book on a couch and fully absorb things. Um, and so um, I put out a tweet that basically I told people that yes, for the last, you know, since my daughter was born and since I've been away for a little bit, a little while, and since I shut down my chat room and I've got reasons for that. Um, and since I did that, I have been sort of mentoring people for free. And then I explained why, like the real, like reasons for mentor, mentoring um, and, and what that actually means. And it's different than coaching. And so right now the, I think, and when I did that, I actually got over a hundred people that messaged me on Twitter asking, Hey, and, and actually giving me reasons as to why um, they, I, I should mentor them. I'm not like some, you know, I'm not the world's best trader or anything. I'm just sort of telling people, you know, if you want to talk to somebody, I can save you some time in terms of your learning path. Um, but um, right now the, the industry is so filled with people that are calling themselves mentors, but they have monetary gain, monetary incentive to do so. Um, and re really they're just paid coaches. And any, if you've ever been a successful athlete or if you've been in any type of competitive sport, you know that coaches are very different than mentors and um, it's a dangerous path for a lot of people because it uh, enables crutches for them. And this is why I shut down my chat room uh, to be a successful trader. You do not need to join a chat room. You do not need a community. You do not need any of this stuff that promises you a shortcut. Um, what you need is the quickest path to a kick in the ass and then the best way to learn from it. And so, um, when I shut down my chat room, it was with, with the incentive of not giving people a crutch to not trade poorly anymore. And this is an example of what you mean by crutch. What, what, how did you see that show up? Yeah. So uh, a crutch is um, every morning I would post the stocks that I'm looking at. Despite me going through extreme lengths, my wife is in learning and development and I developed a course that is actually like she helped me so that they would absorb as much as possible in the shortest period of time. Um, and I did all of this. I gave them parameters on how to trade. I gave them um, exactly how to lay out their spreadsheets to analyze their trades, to do more than a thousand trades in almost the exact same way, which is the only way that you can actually learn uh, whether you're, you have an edge or not statistically. And despite giving them all of that, they still wanted to copy all of my trades as I made them. And so it became counterproductive for me to continue enabling them. Whereas what they really just needed to do was go out there and try and fail. And so yeah. I shut stuff down. Yeah. yeah I think I one I one of my favorites is I, I, I've been doing YouTube lives for forever. And, you know, Stephen and, and Dell, yeah, I'm sure you know the ticker ACB Aurora Cannabis. Yeah, sure I, I always love it because every time I do this YouTube live, People ask me what I think about ACB. And every time I'm like, it's a piece of crap. It's probably going to zero. And then five minutes later in the YouTube live, someone will be like, what do you think about ACB? And I'm like, oh, damn it. I'm like, are you serious? Because it's like the number one bag holder stock on Robinhood. Everyone's bagged in ACB. And I'm like, I, I ignore them. I won't, but I'm just like, to, in my brain, I'm like, somebody just asked about this again. Somebody asked about it last week. Somebody asked about it last month. I'm like, what do you want me to tell you about ACB? <laughs> no, it's, it's a pet hate for me. Like, I don't know, I don't know what you know, but I remember like I, I started out a YouTube channel cause I thought I can, uh, oh, I'm just going to document the entire journey, learning how to stock trade and prove if it works or not. 
And uh, my channel was really popular in the early days, the first year when I was losing every single week. But now, now that I make money, no one wants to watch. Now that I'm given <laughs> valuable information, insights and lessons, no one cares anymore. And, um, and, I, and it blows my mind. And then I just think of the same with Tim Sykes though. Like Tim Sykes can put 20 minute video lessons that no one wants to watch. So he does put a picture of a yacht on and everyone looks at it. Yep. And I just think, I just think what the fucking hell is the world that I live in? Yeah. And what is, but I mean, but these are the people that you're making money from at the end of the day. So you've, exactly. got, to, you've got to thank them and then you've got to get mad at them at the same time. <laughs> well this, said. Is, this is, this is true in most areas of life. And there's a, a really great <laughs> book on the, 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 basically the development of organisms and the amount of success uh, in terms of percentages goes down the more the um, let's say I'm going to give an example. So if you're uh, have a classroom, if you have a classroom at school and there's 10 kids in there, um, the amount, the amount of touch time and one-on-one -on -one time they have with the teacher is pretty good. Uh, whereas if that was a 500 person classroom, then the amount of touch time is, is lower, but um, you know, uh, in the world of organisms um, and companies that fail, uh, it's not the amount of time that you get with a teacher. It's on how, how responsive or how absorbent the, uh, you are to the ideas. Um, and it really means that, you know, you can put a wide net out like Tim Sykes does and the people that really are passionate are going to dig through and find the value. And if you, um, if you, if your objective is to teach everybody inside of your chat room or your community, um, the, how to trade and ha have them all be successful, it's a failure. And so advertising that is, you know, a bit of a misnomer as well as we know, but advertising the fact that you're just going to learn is really the best thing you can do because it'll bring the right people in and the other people that were going to fail anyway, whether you taught them the right thing or not, um, not gonna, they're, they might waste some money on you, but they're not going to waste too much of their time uh, because it, it's boring to your point. Uh, I find that extremely fascinating what you're saying. And I think it rings true. Um, and it's, and it's made me think a few things that I've not really thought before. So thank you for that comment. But at the same time, does everybody not deserve the same fair chance? No. Should you really judge someone? <laughs> should you really judge someone before they've even tried? Uh, it's not up to you as a as an educator. You you just kind of if if someone comes to you, you can't you can't. Yeah, but I, but I love the point. I but love the point the that sponges. you just made. Dal, you're saying look for the people who look like they are the sponge that they're going to absorb uh, as much as possible from you. Those are the people maybe you want to just you know, be more attentive to because they're going to be wanting to soak it all up. They're your core user, right? And so this yeah. is, it goes back to like my, in the world of products, it's the same thing. You, you, you find who soaks up the most and then you put all of your energy into, into that, that, that group. Um, and everything sort of kind of comes to, kind of comes together and people will evolve and they'll come back to you as that core user and that's what sort of is the dream i guess of any educators to have a whole bunch of people that get it yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, only, the only the only other thing i'd say because i thought you made an interesting point do you not think that you can inspire people with the, the yachts and the boats and the money and then they start finding the love of the game of trading and then they start developing the right habits to learn do you think that's possible or do you think well, i mean have you ever started a relationship with a complete physical attraction you know how that usually goes it's the same type of thing no no yeah me could be girlfriend's a stripper <laughs> <laughs> the exception <laughs> no Most i'm in dubai there's no there's no strippers yet it's, it's uh haram <laughs> del is there anything else before we close this up that you think is important for a beginner trader to know what would be uh, yes absolutely um I would say steer clear of, of, of the, um, landmines, um, any trading capital 
uh, that you have is so vital. Okay, so there's, there's this number one point I think I want to make sure I get across to people and I'm telling people that I talk to and they're mentoring constantly is uh, y- there's no way to identify your edge if you don't track and if you don't track and if you don't um, analyze your trading in the right way. If you were to trade, spend, let's say the next year trading and all of your trades were um, not the same in the sense that it's hard to kind of compare apples to oranges, um, then there's no way for you to extrapolate that you have an edge in the market or not based off of the strategy you're trading, unless you try to make sure or that you actually absolutely make sure through, um, you know, I, I've seen in another one of your podcasts, deliberate practice. You make sure that how you track your trades, the environment in which you trade, your emotional state, uh, all of this is tracked and as consistent as humanly possible so that you have more, uh, a better sense that statistically you have an edge in the market if you continue to trade this way. And you need to do this trade a trade as many times as possible in the same way as humanly possible uh, a thousand times before you can be sure. And so ask yourself how many times or how long does it take to do a thousand trades that way? And that's probably a good roadmap for when you're going to become a, a, a profitable trader. And, and you know, minimize your variables too. You know, it's again, that's, that's where, and, and thank you for the plug on the podcast. That's something Steve and I drive home. It's like, just try and do one thing, you know, again, if you're, I mean, if you're doing again, six different strategies or you go to YouTube and you're like, Oh, I'm going to try that. I mean, you're never, you're never going to win. I mean, I mean, you got to have that long mindset and just do the same thing. If you're jumping back and forth, hard, you know, large cap, small cap, long, short, you know, all over the place, you know, buy and break out, short and break downs. It's like, man, you're, you're just, even if it does work, you're never going to be able to, pull that out and know what that you know you can never find yeah. that one thing and just just i just want to add just because i don't want anyone to get lost but for example um the way to build the strategy and the way to build the processes around this for the listeners is say a stock has its first green day you say okay the one variable is it's had a green day then you want to add more and more variables to get a narrow focus so you say what was the volume on the first green day? What was the float on the first green day? What was the news? What was the sector? What was the time of day I bought it? How was I feeling? How hot was the, the, the market at the time? How many stocks were up on the day? Um, is the SPY and NASDAQ up or down on the day? So there's just 10 from the top of my head, which were all kind of, um, and then you've got the fundamentals. Does the company make money? <laughs> is it a contract? Like, it, 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 does it have dilution? You can go on and on. There's 13. Like if you track all of these variables, you'll get to the point where it's pretty hard not to make money from the pattern. It's pretty hard not to. Do you know what I mean? And it's it's as simple as that and mechanical as that. That's right. Yeah. And there's there's nobody has clairvoyance. Nobody's, um, you know, nobody's uh, cheating in any way when it comes to the market. And so no. just shut down the chat room uh, and go back to the drawing board, pen and paper, and identify what your plan is going to be for the next two years, which is how long that will t- that process on average will take judging by the people that I've talked to. Um, and so, yeah. And yeah. I mean, my, meanwhile, you know, you know, part, I, I don't know how familiar you are with, with us bringing Kim on with the podcast. So, um, you know, Kim's kind of learning trading these stocks and, and we have a long running argument. Meanwhile, Steven's trying to get her to short a 1 million float stock on its first green day. And here <laughs> you are telling wait, wait two years. And I'm like, <laughs> he's not saying that he's not saying that for what no I i'm saying that's Del, what you're saying <laughs> no, no, Del, Del i was not throwing you that. under the bus <laughs> no no i i think what Dell said earlier you you shouldn't be learning from chat rooms you should kind of get kicked in the ass and when you get kicked in the ass you face adversity and when you face adversity it gives you the drive to learn am i under yeah he's thumbs up there which our long-standing argument is tim says paper trade I say trade and experience the loss of money. Not a lot, just experience the loss. And um, what's your best opinion for someone starting? Yeah, I, I would say um, actual paper trade. Ac- actually, actually mark up a chart 
not physically on paper, but mark up a chart, understand the chart, trade it, you know, cal do all your calculations. And it's, and it's just the point being that, um, you know, the easier it is for you to click a button, buy, sell, the faster you'll forget it. Whereas yeah. if you, if you plan it beforehand, and, and every single trade you do that, you plan it beforehand, you'll start picking up on the nuances of trading and you'll start picking up on your emotional state and how that affected your decision making, all that type of stuff. Whereas buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, hey, I'm in the green, it doesn't teach you anything. Well and especially if it's a paper trade. Yeah, that's well said. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Dell, I would like to thank you. Man, this, was, uh, this is definitely one of my, my, my favorites, man. I really appreciate your your thoughtfulness and you know just the the analytic nature of of what you do i think there's a ton of nuggets in this podcast and uh so you know you i mean again you kind of mentioned the podcast is kind of you know come and gone but like like where can people find you on twitter where can they find those podcasts etc yeah sure um well um on twitter you can find me at dell the trader um i will Usually D -E one, one L right. D E L. D yeah. D E L okay. the trader. Okay. Um, and usually I'll be posting some charts of some, you know, if I made a really cool trade, I'll, I'll post it up there. Um, if you want to learn from me or learn on my methodology, you can go to YouTube and watch a variety of free, uh, YouTube videos. Um, I think including some full length trading sessions, if you can find them on there. Um, and then also, um, I have the course that I developed uh, with the help of my wife. Um, that one is on trading small cap stocks and tracking your trades and the whole analytical nature that we, we talked about. Um, parameters, all that type of stuff. Um, that is at activetraders.chat, which is uh, our, our, my old chat room that is now just a, a link to a, a video page. All right, well, I would like to thank you, Kim. Thank you, Stephen. And of course, thank you, Dell. And to the listener out there, um, as I always like to remind you, if you're on iTunes, you can head over to steadytrade.com. We'll have all those links. So, you know, if you're driving or whatever and you missed what Dell said, we'll link those in the post. And as always, I would like to thank you for listening to the Steady Trade Podcast, and we'll see you next time.